Hi there and welcome to the Stock Club Podcast. I'm James and with me this week is Emmett, Rory, Anne-Marie and Mike from the My Wall Street Stock Analyst teams. Today, we're talking about the volatility of the current market and how it's affecting high growth stocks including the Trade Desk, Virgin Galactic and Etsy. Why Peloton's big product recall is nothing for investors to worry about. And we pitch two companies that are not on the My Wall Street shortlist at the minute. Love Sack and Genius Sport. So guys, we have another new voice on the Stock Club podcast today. Mike, welcome to Stock Club. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do here at My Wall Street and what are the companies or industries you're most interested in? So I've been working with uh, Emmet on Horizon for the last almost a year now. And uh, I've been looking at a lot of cybersecurity companies recently, which is as interesting as it sounds. And I'd say I have particular interest in the gambling industry, which you'll see later on the show. So You used to work at a bookies, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> About five years ago. Yeah, that, that must be where the, the love for gambling comes from. Mike's like Kevin from The Office. He's always looking for a bet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason he's appearing on the podcast now. He lost the bet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. And we love getting feedback and compliments from listeners about Stock Club. But one recent tweet we got asked us to do a segment on Dogecoin um, in a future episode. So guys, I don't know about you, but I'm more than happy to put my hand up and say that I still have no idea what Dogecoin is. Rory, what what are your thoughts after watching SNL over the weekend? I still don't know what it is. It's a I didn't watch SNL. Um, by all accounts, Elon looked a bit silly in a Wario outfit. Apparently, it crashed the coin. Did yeah, that, like it was. He called it a hustle, which probably is, <laughs> wasn't the best thing to call it if he's trying to bump it. Yeah. So was he promoting it, or is he or is he dumping on it? At the moment, not really sure. Mike and Anne Marie, you guys are uh, you guys are of a younger generation than us. Are you all down with the kids with Dogecoin? Um, not exactly. I mean, I watched Elon Musk on SNL, and he called it a a hustle, and kind of nodded when they said, "Oh, it's a scam." And then, like two days later, tweeted, "Should Tesla accept Dogecoin?" So it's um not insider trade. It's not um insider trading but maybe it's like as close as you can get <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's skirting along the line all right Emmett, what are your thoughts yeah i ran a poll on twitter because you know i likewise i don't really know what the heck is happening here and 550 549 people responded to the question which is or was positioned as it's the year 2030 you can tip the pizza guy with dogecoin pay for a flight with it buy a house invest in fine art dogecoin is an accepted currency everywhere and i had four, four choices which was yes 100 percent likely unlikely are no ridiculous mm. and 42 percent of the 549 people who voted said it was absolutely ridiculous but to my surprise 11 percent of people said yes it's 100 percent and then 10 percent of people said it was likely so we have 21 22 percent of people um said that dogecoin is highly likely going to be a dominant currency in the year 2030 and only really intelligent people follow me on twitter so one out of four (laughs) (laughs) only one out of like one out of four people reckon it's it's happening and that's where it's completely incongruous my understanding of the world i'm i'm looking at it with the question mark floating over my head yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let's move on to things that we actually do know about. So as I'm sure every single person listening to us today knows, the market has been having a bit of a stinker lately. Over the past few weeks, we've seen some of the top performing stocks from last year suffer pretty significant sell-offs. And it's kind of felt like the whole market is crashing around our ears. Amazingly, though, when you look at the indexes, this is actually not a widespread phenomenon. So the Dow Jones is actually less than 1.5% off its all-time highs at the minute, while the S&P 500 is just over 1% off its highs. Even the tech-heavy Nasdaq that hasn't suffered as badly as one might expect. So Emmett, I want to come to you here first. What's kind of going on when you're looking at your portfolio and seeing, you know, pretty big percentages being lopped off it over over the space of a few days or a week, but then you look at the indexes and, and they're not doing too badly. What's going on at the moment? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. It, it hurts because we're growth investors mostly here at My Wall Street. We we look for businesses that are out to create a better future and we put some of our hard-earned capital into those businesses. And it really 
does hurt. There's no imagined feeling when you buy a stock for 100 bucks and find in a matter of weeks it's down to 50 bucks. And that has a many psychological triggers, most of all l- lamenting today's price, wishing you'd held off, cursing the day you bought it. And then you look at the, uh, the different indices. And as you said, the S&P 500 is still floating at highs. So you're like, wow, the benchmark index is up and everything I own is down. And this is a phenomenon I've personally observed in my own portfolio. Portfolio. It's a phenomenon that's translated into the Horizon portfolio, which is my own portfolio, and um, and it, it hurts. But what you, I suppose there, there's three factors I think that are are uh, uh, being superimposed onto the stock market at the moment. The first is this: there's a rotation out of tech. You know, yeah. like people are selling <laughs> lemonade to buy something else. Lemonade is a stock I love. It reported last night where we were recording this on Wednesday. Um, I loved what I saw. The stock in after hours was dumped and, and it, was in, it was totally at odds with the business we're looking at at the moment. So there's a rotation out of tech or at least out of growth. The second is fears of inflation. Um, now, since modern economies were conceived inflation has always been looming it happens um and it's it's quite unfortunate really that this is a fear how can can we quantify what sell-off is attributable to fear of inflation well i i certainly can't i haven't found anyone who can but it's part of the the narrative that's out there at the moment and thirdly and it is very real is the the rise of the retail investor which we've all discussed in the past and we know about is um money is being pulled out of stocks to go into things like dogecoin um i see it in my own home my son who's a really talented stock investor is now pitching uh cryptos to me for his coinbase and um he explains to me their angle but the explanation is as shallow as the promoter's <laughs> explanation. Like we're looking, we we were kind of laughing at some new cryptocurrency there the other evening, which is all about regulating banks or like for, <laughs> it was like, that, this is completely at odds with yeah. what cryptocurrency was conceived to do, which was to stay away from regulation. But anyway, um, so there's three things. There's uh, rotation, there's inflation, and there's crypto, and they're converging as three forces which are hitting the types of stocks that are out to create a better future. And really, for me, uh, as I'll discuss in a while, uh, uh, relating to Virgin Galactic, there, there's um, uh, this is presenting opportunities. But you know what? I just don't know what the next few weeks or months will bring. Nobody does. What are your thoughts on this, Rory? Yeah, I mean, I'm one of those people who really hates all the kind of stock market superstitions. Um, but selling may go away was a good one this year for the ones it yeah, like it for really once, did yeah. kick off this month just to in terms of the the sector rotation um carl cantanilla uh from cnbc he always does a kind of um tweets the kind of all-time highs of the day and i think it was uh last week he tweeted like a big long list of them and there wasn't a single tech company in there who was wow. uh target whirlpool yum brands hershey's um, Berkshire Capital One, Goldman Sachs, all the old kind of dad stocks that uh, that you know were were kind of classic kind of blue chip companies that we haven't really heard much about over the over the last. Couple it's of nineteen eighty again, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I mean, like in terms of the tech companies, you know, I'm looking at a company like Snowflake, for example. That stock has been cut in half since its highs in December and it is still trading at like 90x time sales. Yeah. So, you know, that just gives you a sense of uh, of how mad the market was for some of these high growth tech companies. In many of the cases, it's not exactly discount stocks even still. Anne-Marie, what are your thoughts on the, the current market at the moment? Um, I agree a lot with Emmett in terms of the impact of the retail investor. Like we have to kind of remember that not only is the equity market, but kind of every everything from EFTs to crypto to even options trading has been kind of placed into territory we've never seen before because of the amount of money that kind of middle and upper class people have had to hold on to because of stay at home orders in the pandemic. Yeah. And so it meant that they had all this money sitting in savings and they just needed places to put it. And I think they started with the stock market and they have absolutely gone off the rails since then and started pushing money into everything like collectibles and trading cards and stuff like that. And like just to kind of provide some quantifiable context to it, if we go back to January of 2021 and we look back upon the year, 
Over the course of the year, we saw 10 million individual brokerage accounts be opened, and retail investors now make up 25% of the trading volume on the U.S. equity market. And just to kind of put that into color, in 2019, average daily volume was about $7 billion, and as of January of 2021, it had reached $14.7 billion, wow. which is a, which is a quite significant change. And I think that it just means that the volatility on the market is going to be so much worse. All of our highs are going to be higher. All of our lows are going to be lower. And it would appear that some of that retail investor cash is beginning to cycle back out of the market as on March 26th, individual investors purchased about 772 million of U.S. equities. And that was a 60 percent decline from the two billion it reached in one day on January 29th, which was like the height of the GameStop meme stop craze. Yeah. And so I don't know whether these investors are going to stay or go, but either way, they're going to have an impact on the market. And if they're pulling their cash out to move it into you know riskier things or move it into crypto, it does mean that all of the markets are going to be hit and they're going to sink a little bit. But I guess you can take solace in the fact that it means that maybe we're, we will achieve greater levels of stability. And so yeah. I guess as we go into these quarterly reports, they can kind of sting because you can be looking at these companies and think, oh, they're doing really well. Why is the stock tanking? But I guess the advice to take is you kind of have to tune out this overall market noise and remember that company fundamentals are going to pay off over the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And and you mentioned quarterly reports there, which is what I want to move on to next. So, you know, in in addition to all of these inflation worries and rotations out of growth stocks, we're in the middle of earnings season, which is classically a very, very volatile stock time for stocks anyway. So um, most US companies have kind of reported on their results from the first quarter of the year um, recently. And I thought we'd briefly touch on a few of these most significant earnings earnings reports and chat a little bit about them in context of the wider market. Rory, I'm going to come over to you first with the trade desk. Um, Shares in the trade desk fell almost 26% on Monday, despite the company absolutely smashing its earnings report. Revenue was up 37%. Revenue guidance was raised by management and the company absolutely almost doubles the expectations in terms of earnings per share. Um, Was it just general market jitters that caused a sell-off or what happened? (laughs) The tr- so, I mean, just in terms of the broader market, you do go through these earnings quarters or these earnings periods every now and again where it seems like nothing's good enough. You know, yeah. like the, yeah, we've, I think uh, September 2018 or 2019, 2018 was a period where like every single one of our stocks dropped like 10, 20 percent, no matter what was reported. It was like there just wasn't a good enough result for the market. The trade desk's results were very Good, very strong. Like mm. you said, revenue was up 37%, earnings were up 56%. Retention was above 95%, which is a streak that company has maintained for over seven years now. Um, and, you know, sometimes when you see them beat on earnings and beat on revenue, you think, oh, maybe guidance was a little bit weak. No, guidance was way above expectations. I think they said revenue was going to be up something like 87% at yeah, the Yeah, at the top end, yeah. So, you know, you just kind of look at it and you go, how can this be a kind of sell-off? And, you know, maybe there was a bit of kind of jitters about Unified ID 2.0, which is this kind of new internet protocol that's going to to replace cookies. I think there's probably a bit of worry that Alphabet has an awful lot of control in that situation. And will they kind of leverage that to kind of take some share away from the likes of the trade desk? But on the other side, you think like, look, the stock tripled last year. um, And that was after what was already a very, very strong run up through the years. So there is just this really heightened expectation about this company and and it's just good isn't good enough. Sometimes they need to continue, you know, it, it was priced really to perfection and they need to keep hitting those expectations, you know. Um, for me, I think what's really important when looking at earnings reports is, is management hitting their own expectations? Yeah. Don't really worry about too much about Wall Street's expectations. If management's consistently not hitting their own expectations, that's something to worry about because that's a sign of, that management doesn't understand the business and doesn't understand the challenges that they have. Yeah, that, that's a good perspective to take. Let's move on then to another company. And I wanted to ask you about this company, Emmett, which is, of course, Virgin Galactic. So Virgin Galactic was one of the big high flyers of last year, jumping more than fivefold in value between its flotation in late 2019 and its all-time high in February of this year. Of course, the company doesn't actually make any money um, at all yet because it's, it's not sending people to space yet. And it seems like investors might have started to run out of patience a little bit with the company. Do you think there's been a shift in, in wider market sentiment away from companies with these grand visions towards companies with actual fundamentals to back up what they're doing? Oh, yeah, for sure. People want to see businesses that are operating preferably in a cash flow positive environment right now. And that's just the mood of the moment. But isn't it quite funny that people have lost patience 
with space tourism like yeah. you know uh, come on you know it's taken how many tens of thousands or multiples of thousands of years depending on your belief set for humankind to get to this point and it is quite stunning that one could invest in a space exploration company for the masses a year ago and now say oh, to heck with that I don't believe in it anymore it's really crazy but let me, let me tell you about the story of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and Richard Branson, because effectively they are the three entrepreneurs that are pointing rockets at the sky and they have a mission to get people up there. Um, what's quite interesting about Blue Origin, which is obviously Jeff Bezos's enterprise, SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, is they, they have different goals with a certain amount of overlap, but all of them were founded uh, effectively 20 years ago, either the year 2000, 2001, 2002, those three businesses were founded. So they've been in operation for longer than than they've been in the vast majority of our consciousness. And and like they have, like, like for example, Elon Musk's venture, SpaceX, has been around longer than he's been the CEO of Tesla. So this is yeah. not something new in the life of Elon Musk. It's actually something old. So let me talk about SpaceX to start. Like it was, it was founded in 2002, and as most people have noticed, it's completed numerous launches, you know, both commercial and government. And and a few years ago, it became the first private company to send a spacecraft up to the International Space Station. Uh, and about a year ago, it was the first company to send humans to space and to the International Space Station. And NASA has selected it as a vendor um, for the first uh, moon landing since I think it was 1972 or thereabouts, certainly in the 70s. So that's SpaceX. And it's the one I think that garners the most media attention. And when and those vertical uh, liftoffs and, and landings are pretty amazing. And we saw one there just during the week. I, what's kind of interesting, and it's so typically Elon Musk, he said um, last year, that he wants to establish a city of 1 million people on Mars by the year 2050. And settlers will get there using a fleet of 1,000 SpaceX starships. So that's big thinking right there. You know, it's mind-blowing thinking. So in, in 30 years? In 30 years, we'll have a million folks um, on Mars. I, I won't be one of them. I've no interest <laughs> going up there. Neither do I. We have a beautiful planet here. I'd far prefer us to just fix this one. Anyway, so that's that's SpaceX. So Jeff Bezos founded Blue Origin, and it's been qu very quiet because this is his baby. And, and and Jeff Bezos sells about a billion dollars worth of Amazon shares every every so often to fund the entire operation. And its mission is to make space exploration cheaper through boosters that can be recycled for future launches, which sounds very much like SpaceX. And yeah. for years, the company has been testing the sub, a sub, a suborbital rocket, which I think is called New Shepard. And they they plan on taking tourists up, which is, is kind of encroaching into Virgin Galactic's uh, space, no pun intended. And then in May, Blue Origin announced that the first flight will take place, I think it's in a few weeks from now, July, end of July, maybe August, and the first seat will be auctioned for charity. So suddenly we have a direct competitor yeah. uh, with Virgin Galactic. Now, let me just come on to Virgin Galactic, which reported. So we, we have SpaceX in one corner, we have Blue Origin in another, and Virgin Galactic, it doesn't launch rockets straight up the way the other the other two companies do it. They, they basically are flown, their rockets are flown to 50,000 feet by what I would call a, 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 an airplane. I, I'm sure specialists would call it a big airplane or perhaps a very powerful airplane, but I don't know the jargon, as you can see. <laughs> but from, so they basically, they, they send up the rocket on this dual fuselage jet called the White Knight 2. And from there, the Virgin Galactic ship detaches. It glides for a few seconds. You get the best selfie of the year. Planet Earth out the window. You're floating around in a beautifully designed cabin. Um, and that's, that's the dream. That's the yeah. plan. And, and no one has actually done it yet. Uh, as in no paying member of the public has done it. Uh, the company has sold 600 tickets for about a quarter of a million uh, dollars a pop. Um, and they now expect to send people up in the year 2021. Now, this is where I think the story gets a little more interesting. So customers, as I said, will be able to float around and eventually uh, once spacecraft is pulled back into the Earth's atmosphere, it gets piloted and landed, I think, like a regular airplane on, on their New Mexico runway. Um, and, and Virgin Galactic, it, it, the intent is to operate a 
fleet of these vehicles that can fly people up for the photograph and the weightlessness, but also could fly people to space hotels, um, transport researchers to labs up in space, um, or provide lightning fast transcontinental flights. So the old traditional London to Sydney in a couple of hours, that's the overused example. And I think that opportunity is huge because it is quite a journey to go from one side of the planet to the other. So that's what they all do. But let me tell you what happened after the market closed on Monday. So Virgin Galactic reported a loss. Wow, imagine a rocket ship company that hasn't managed to commercialize yet has reported a loss. They they reported a loss of 55 cent per share on pretty much no revenue, which was short of analysts' expectations. And they expected a loss of 27 cent per share. So the net loss of 130 million was an improvement over 337 million net loss in the same quarter a year ago. Yep. What's really important for us as investors is, well, do they have cash for runway? Um, yeah. Not the tarmac type, but just to keep going. And so at the end of December, Virgin Galactic had 666 million on the balance sheet. Uh, I think it now is about 617 million on the balance sheet. And that's loads. But shares tumbled and they said that they'd encountered another technical problem that could force a second postponement uh, of a plant test flight, which was due this month in May. Yeah. But really, that's only a couple of weeks of postponement. Repairs have been largely completed and, and the glitch was on the, the airplane that brings them up, not the spacecraft. And, and, and it has been fixed. But what what I think is, and I'm sorry, James, I know I'm, I'm, I'm waffling on here a bit, but just to say that the company still aims to fly Richard Branson up this summer. Yeah. And they said they will resume ticket sales after doing so. But all we heard on Monday was that's been delayed because we don't want anyone to die. And for me, that's a perfectly acceptable reason. So, you know, do you you think it's kind of that classic short term view of the quarterly reporting cycle is affecting this company that, you know, by its nature needs a long term view and long term, not even as in just a few quarters, long term is in a few years or even a few decades? Unquestionably so. And when I when I pitched Virgin Galactic for Horizon in the pitch video, I said something to the effect of that had you bought shares in Dell, and if you, I've overused this example, but had you bought shares in Dell and held them through the 90s, you'd have made a fortune. Yeah. Uh, but the first half of that decade was unglamorous. There was nothing happening. Like yeah. shares in Dell were flat because that home computer, office computer concept hadn't actually quite absorbed. It's the exact same here. You don't truly, utterly believe something till you know somebody who has it or who has done it. And, you know, I think... I'd be surprised if any of our listeners, any of our listeners around the world have considered going up for space tourism. But I'd be even more shocked if in five years from now, a reasonable percentage of them had not either done so or have somebody in their family who's done it. Absolutely. Let's move on to the final stock then. And Mike, I'm going to come to you with this. So Etsy was a massive winner last year and they really made hay while the sun shined in selling masks and other bespoke items online. The company's Q1 report last week was a good one too, with revenue up a staggering 141% compared to last year and gross merchandise sales or basically the amount of stuff sold on the platform up 132% hit over $3 billion and um, as is the case these days Etsy stock you know fell after a report even though it was a good one Mike do you think that you know you were saying before we came on recording that you think Etsy might end up being a victim of their own success in the coming quarters what do you mean by that? Yeah well I think Etsy's earnings is really interesting because it's indicative of what all the high flyers of last year will come up against in Q2 onwards. So I think Shopify, Zoom, Peloton, any of the companies that are kind of growing revenue in the three digits kind of space that were all perfect pandemic plays. So what will happen now is that they're going to come up against their comparables from last year, which were, as we've seen, off the charts. And that'll mean a deceleration of growth for all of these companies. So that's why Etsy fell about 15% yeah. after saying it grew earnings almost 150%. So it set guidance for gross merchandise sales of 2.8 to 3.1 billion, mm. which would be a 5 to 15% growth. You compare this to 128% growth it achieved this quarter, you can see why the drop is so significant. Yeah, so in terms of growth figures, you know, it, it looks flat. But, you know, it's still maintaining that, that that strength that it has got. So, you know, on one hand, you can say it's not growing. But on the other hand, you can say it's managing to maintain this massive pull forward it got. Kind of like, I suppose, we saw with Netflix and its subscribers back in January. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's still an excellent business and I don't think it's a bad thing, especially for investors to see the company come back down to earth a bit, I suppose. It's not, it's not groundbreaking stuff here, but like 100% growth rates aren't really sustainable in the long term. So yeah. to see these businesses come back to more reasonable valuations and more manageable, I suppose, growth will be interesting going forward and I think better for long-term investors. That might be a tactic Virgin Galactic are doing. If they're not actually making any revenue, they don't have to worry about comps year over year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely coming back down to earth anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it is, it's an important thing, I think, for investors to be aware of over the next few quarters that, you know, that massive pull forward because of, you know, literally a world stopping event like a pandemic will have an effect on these companies and, and to kind of look past the 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 broad figures let's move on then rory and i know we're kind of running out of time but i know you want to talk about this because you are a resident peloton bull so one of the biggest pieces of news over the last few weeks was that peloton was recalling all of its treadmill products due to safety concerns and although these treadmills only represent less than three percent of peloton's total unit sales this incident was surely damaging to the brand of a company that has been you know so popular over the last year that it's actually been struggling to fulfill customer orders coming in um, Rory, what are your thoughts on this? Is this something Peloton and Peloton investors should be worried about? Yes. Yeah, so when the story first broke, I think it was maybe two or three weeks ago, I think I was quite dismissive of it. Um, well, that was my kind of instant reaction and not to trivialise kind of injury or, 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 or anything like that, that, that shouldn't happen. But, you know, my, my first thought was, well, treadmills are dangerous, you know, yeah. they're a dangerous piece of equipment. It's why, you know, we don't let kind of children in gyms and things like that. Then as the kind of story developed, it did seem like there was like a flaw in the design that Peloton did need to address. And... And now they have, and they've come out and they've said they're going to recall all their treadmills. And um, for, in ter- so, I mean, that's just the first kind of reaction. Then in terms of the business, I, it seems like it's not going to have a huge impact on the business overall. They came in on the call and said that the thread, the the cheaper model was a very easy fix. Uh, the thread plus was a bit more complicated, but they thought sales could be back as early as July. And they reckon it's going to cost them about 165 million in total. Now, this is a company that generated three billion dollars in revenue last year and has two billion dollars in cash on the books. So, you know, yeah. it's it's a real small drop in the ocean. Um, in terms of damage to the brand, I, I, like I don't know. I, personally, I don't think it is going to be a big damage to the brand. I think people really love these products. Um, I think people understand that treadmills are, are dangerous and that, yeah. and that and that you know, any time a hardware company ship something there is always that chance that there's a design flaw well that was the that was the point i was going to make you know we see with companies car manufacturers are the first that come to mind that seem to be eternally issuing product recalls for things like you know i remember ford one time had a had a dodgy seat belt and you know even a dodgy clasp on a door is, is this just something you have to expect if you're investing in a company that produces hardware items like this I think it's something you have to expect with any company. There's, yeah. the, you know, the accidents always happen, no matter whether it's a hardware company or it could be a software company with a major glitch or a data breach. Or, you know, there's always that risk, that element is that something's just going to go wrong. And, you know, the, the kind of crisis management 101 is that when something bad happens, you get out in front of it, you do a mea culpa, you do a mea culpa from the top, from the, the person who's who's in charge of the business, and you overcorrect. And yeah. that is what that, that is what they're doing, I think. Um, they might have, you know, they could have done it a little bit sooner, I suppose, but they're doing it now. Um, I, I really, I, I might be proven wrong, but I really don't see that this is going to have a long term impact on the business. You know, just in the last quarter, there were 150,000 connected workouts. That was up 50 percent from the previous quarter, not from the not year over year, from the yeah. previous quarter. Oh. And people are using these things 20 on average 26 times a month. And um, the engagement on these devices is massive. People love them. People are waiting months to get them and willing to pay up this this huge price that people said a few years ago, no one's going to spend that on, a, on an exercise bike. That's just not the case. So um, I'll, I'll wait to see what happens, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be one of those things that we look back on in a few years and go, I can't believe that was even a story. You know? Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, let's move on then and take a quick look at all the things going on in my Wall Street at the moment. So we're midway through the month already. And that means we have both a new Stock of the Month report and the exclusive Stock of the Month podcast live in my Wall Street right now. We're also adding a brand new stock pick to our shortlist on Monday, May 17th. Rory, I have to ask, how hard is it to pick a stock to add to my Wall Street right now, considering all that's going on? 
It's easier than it was last year. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you that. It's, it's easier. It's it's harder dealing, you know, when, when stocks are crumbling, you know, it's hard to look at the ones you've picked and you're, you can sometimes, you know, maybe second guess yourself. But it's definitely easier picking new stocks than it is when everything's going up, every, you know, 10% yeah. every week. So mm-hmm. at least there's yeah. some companies out there that we've been looking at for a while that are, you know, an awful lot cheaper than they were three weeks ago. <laughs> Good. Sounds exciting. Can't wait to see it. And um, so remember, it's only members of the My Wall Street community get access to all of this great stuff. So if you want to check it out, just tap the link in the notes for today's show and start your free trial. Um, Jargon Busters. So we've got two questions here today. The first one I'm going to throw over to you, Anne Marie. Um, so we recently had a My Wall Street member write in and ask our opinion on the company Lovesack. This is a company most famous for its giant beanbag chairs. And I believe you've done a bit of digging into them previously. Yeah, I had a look at them about two quarters ago when they kind of first came on my radar when they were seeing a significant recovery from the pandemic and they were doing exceptionally well. So I dug into them to kind of see what they were about. And there is a lot to love yeah. about Lovesack. Like, you know, um, they are they have kind of two main product offerings. They're sacks, which are their absolutely gigantic beanbag chairs. And then they make these things called sectionals, which are modular couches. <laughs> which uh, basically you buy each kind of individual element of a couch and you can customize it to make it into any size or shape you want and include any kind of amenities that you'd want, you know, cup holders, footrests, so, storage, that type of thing. Like Lego furniture. Yeah, basically. And there are a lot of things that are appealing about it. It's, they have a founder, CEO. They have industry-leading sales per square foot. Their stores in the mall actually remind you a lot of Tesla stores in a mall and that they just kind of have each of the individual elements. And you get to go around and pick what color you want and how many mm. modules you want and that type of thing. Um, they are also exceedingly popular with millennials and Gen Z. And maybe most importantly, and the thing I found most appealing is that they are highly committed to sustainability. So they're the largest repurposer of plastic bottles in the United States. All of the wow. fabric that they use is made 100% with um, renewable plastic, and they want to be 100% sustainable by 2040 with no emissions and no waste. Another interesting thing about that is they actually buy the padding that they use in the bean bags. They buy excess padding from their competitor couch companies, and they shred it up and put it inside the bean bags. So basically, they are they've kind of revolutionized the relationship between. Um, people and furniture companies in that they want you to keep this couch for 20 years. They they sell yeah. each of the kind of couch components individually. If you know your couch starts to look grubby, they want you to bring it back and they'll replace the fabric. You know, they don't want you to throw the whole thing out. If you're tired of it, you don't want it anymore, they will buy it off you and resell it and refurbish it and remanufacture it. So it's, it's a pretty nice looking company. My kind of few notes of hesitation, which is why it's still sitting on a waiting list and maybe not um, experiencing more uh, consideration for my Wall Street was they have a very small number of products mm. and they had been kind of hinting that they would be introducing new products and that was exciting for me because I was kind of like oh if we have kind of a rotation away from home goods which may happen as people no longer have to spend 24 hours a day in their homes um, they might be hit pretty hard and then I also wanted to see an improvement in gross margin and I wanted to make sure that this wasn't a pandemic trend kind of as yeah. I said previously so I took a look at their most recent quarterly report and they are doing a lot of things right their sales increased and their cost decreased so we saw a 10 point increase in their gross margin in 2020 which is quite good and their gap and they hit gap profitability for the first time ever which is quite good and they're gaining significant retail space through uh, strategic partnerships with department stores and costco and best buy and they did announce a couple of new products but nothing kind of too revolutionary myself and rory had discussed it and we were like well maybe they'll push into mattresses because that would maybe be a whole new type of revenue stream but the new products that they announced are not quite so innovative so they brought out a guest rest kit, which they designed bed sheets yeah. that will cover four of their kind of um, couch, flat couch modulars. So you can push them together and make a guest bed. And then they made specially designed sheets that will cover these. So that's, you know, one thing. And then they brought out <laughs> seven new fabrics because, you know, you want to be able to customize your couch. Yeah. And um, they announced that they do have a number of products in the pipeline and a number of collaborations with other brands. So they do have some kind of exciting things on the horizon and their uh, improvement in financials is quite impressive. But I think I think for me, I want to make sure that we're going to continue to see people buying these exceptionally expensive couches as we continue to exit the yeah. pandemic. So definitely one to keep on the watch list, it sounds like. Yeah, most definitely. Cool. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question then is one we've actually got in here a few times, but I feel it's an important one to cover considering how it's related to one of the main things we look out for in an investment. So uh, one of our community members wrote in and asked about insider selling, and he'd noticed that some of the companies on our shortlist like Encino and Teladoc had experienced um, 
significant volumes of insider selling from management recently. Um, but I know that we're constantly on the lookout for insider buying as a bullish signal. How much weight do you put on insider selling? I don't put a lot of weight on it, James. And, and I deferred to an expert many years ago to actually form that opinion. And, and the only book I ever read on the subject of insider trading and possibly the only one that was ever written exclusively about the subject is called Investment Intelligence from Insider Trading, um, which is a, well, in my part of the world, is a four-star rating on Amazon from 12 ratings. And it was written by a gentleman called H. Nayat Say which is very easy yeah. to forget but if you just stick into Amazon investment intelligence from insider trading you'll find the book but the, the salient points from the book uh, really are it's very easy to summarize the book and and it's it's this that the author would absolutely huge data sets looked at the subsequent performance of uh, stocks after insiders bought or sold and um, and the most information laden trade of all is where the CEO specifically is buying um, shares in the company that she or he is running at a specific level at a specific share price and I won't uh, divulge the absolute smaller detail because I don't really want to steal the author's thunder but on the subject of selling he, he uh, the author discusses that and finds that the action of a sell is far far less information laden than a purchase so yeah. the CEO buying his shares is an indication uh, within certain parameters of a, a very prosperous future. A CEO or her team selling shares is no indication that share price uh, or that the business is destined for a rocky future because, frankly, insiders have very few opportunities to actually take money off the table. Yeah. You take um, a, a, an entrepreneur who's built a business from the ground up or indeed a CEO who's been brought in to run the business and they're paid a wage or a salary and then they suddenly want to buy the island in the British Virgin Islands and they decide I'll sell some of my shares and they don't necessarily they realize I'm only going to be on this planet for so long I'm going to take some cash off the table and do what I wish. Generally of course they'll try and time it with a little bit of a price spike within the parameters with which they can within which they can sell but bottom line when i see an insider sell as a result of what i learned from this book i don't panic i don't give it too much credence i'd rather yeah they hadn't but um i just shrug my shoulders and for the most part ignore so it's not as much of a signal as insider buying we you and um, alejandro another colleague that works with us here at my wall street actually mm. developed um, a tool to track insider buying i believe Emmett. yeah we did and insider bot is still in development but uh, insider bot is live on twitter you can see the output of our insider trading bot uh, free of charge on twitter and uh, insider bots um handle is at the insider bot and what the insider bot is doing at the moment is tweeting the um, the stocks that it's finding of interest where the buying level and the, the it matches pretty much what the author of the book described. So we, we look and then we've put a few little parameters around it, but we're trying to find quality information. So the insider bot is not tweeting every insider buy, but is, is tweeting insider buys that look like a very bullish signal and we keep tweaking it so mike and alejandro and i are tweaking that um keeping an eye on it and watching the performance of the stocks that insider bot is is, is uh, spotting sounds interesting it's better than that james it's pretty awesome it's not interesting it's awesome sorry it sounds awesome <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> okay guys so before we finish today's show let's get on to the elevator pitch mike as is your first stock club episode you're in the hot seat today you were one of the first big draft king bulls i knew probably because of all your experience working in a bookies in galway so i believe you're <laughs> going to go with another sports betting company today yeah the company today is genius sports yeah as i said i kind of really like the the industry in general, um, the global betting market is set to double in the next five years with the U.S. market growing at a 31% CAGR. Um, I think there's a pressure on a lot of states in the U.S. to uh, recoup losses from COVID. So many of them are turning to legalize gambling as a solution. Yeah, You saw New York announced it there recently. With all that being said, though, I think the sports book market could get very busy. I think there's a lot of fragmentation. There's not a lot of customer loyalty so i kind of picked a pick and shovel play here for the entire industry instead yeah. so kind of if you see the gambling industry growing then genius sports will grow with it and and then how how how, how will that work 
So what Genius does is acquires and processes uh, the feed of live statistics that is sanctioned by sports for collection and distribution. So this okay. is known as official data. And it's essentially mission critical for betting companies to run their sports books on. Uh, so the vast majority of Genius's revenues come from selling this data to betting companies. It also sells it to sports technology companies and media companies. Uh, the company has just over three billion in market cap on revenues of 150 million last year. This was grown at 31 percent. It's founder led. Uh, it's now permitted to supply in 13 U.S. states. It works with 400 sports leagues, 300 sports books, and 100 marketing customers. But I think the real reason why I like the company is because of the live betting applications. So DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins has highlighted it as one of the main priorities for the company mm. is to get into more in-play betting. And Genius Sports obviously has a history in the UK where uh, in-play in betting has been popular for the last maybe five or six years. But I think its application to American sports has reams of potential. So the stop-start nature yeah. in terms of almost every American sport gives away such uh, such potential to in-play betting. So if you can think in terms of being able to bet on the next ball being a strike or a home run or a first down or a touchdown or whatever, that immediate reward could kind of revolutionize how a lot of people watch sports in the US. Yeah. And I think the fact that Genius had powered this already in the UK has great potential for the business. Sounds good. Yeah, definitely an interesting yeah. company. One to keep an eye out for. There is one red flag that I've mentioned before talking about this company with Emmett and that's its gross margins. Yeah. So for 2020, it had a gross margin of 24% and this is attached to the costs involved in buying the data from the sports leagues. And so this is an issue I'd like to see resolved before running out to buy it. I think it kind of reminds me of Spotify and its margin issues over the years in terms yeah. of royalties for music artists and everything. So that's the one thing stopping me buying it right now, essentially. Yeah. Definitely a very interesting company. I like that kind of pick, pick and shovel approach to, to what's going to be a massive industry in the US. I think we can all probably agree. So that's it from this week's Stock Club. Don't forget about all the great new stuff in my Wall Street app at the moment. And if there's anything you'd like us to discuss or explain on the next episode, you can get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at MyWallStreetHQ or email us at pod at MyWallStreet.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Stock Club. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to us on. But don't ask us to talk about Dogecoin again because we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's it from us here today. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Happy investing. Mm -hmm.